Hey. Hi, John. How are you? I already got kicked off the webinar and rejoined. Welcome, everyone, to um, part three of our uh, Winter Warmer series of programs. John, do you want to get us started? Yeah, I was wondering why your share screen stopped. There. Uh, <laughs> welcome back to the webinar. Um, so we have a lot of people here today. I think we have about 300 people signed up for today's program. So we like to, in the beginning of these programs, let you know how you can ask those questions. Uh, the more questions we get, the quicker we try to move, and we want you to ask those questions early. So please use the Q&A box to ask them. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question of our speakers in person, you can click the raise hand symbol and we'll uh, take a look at your username and check with you, and then we'll activate your uh, microphone and camera to ask that question. Uh, we're now also live on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitch. So if you're visiting us from there, you can always ask your questions using those platforms. Um, we look forward to the three presentations today. We have three speakers, Amy, Werner, and Sarah. Um, and the order of presentations, we'll start with Sarah, then we'll have Amy, and then we'll close with Werner. Uh, each of our speakers will be introducing themselves. And uh, I think that's about all I wanted to go over. So, <laughs> John, you're reaching the end of your routine there. Um, I was wondering if anyone who's on the in the audience right now, if you want to post in the chat or on Facebook where that John's monitoring, is it snowing where you are right now? Because it's not where I am at. So I wore my tropical colors in honor of Florida. I'm wearing my shorts. <laughs> so um, I heard from Werner that it's 19 degrees where he is. So this is going to be a very chilly program, John. Um, I see that it's uh, snowing in Minnesota. Of course, that's probably not unexpected. Thanks for joining us, John, uh, the other John Smalley. <laughs> so today we're going to have a great program. I want to encourage everyone to go to our website, californiapreservation.org, where we have an opportunity for you to post photographs of your gingerbread house, because at our next program, which is one of our very popular happy hours, you'll be able to, um, we'll show your gingerbread house, then we'll have a People's Choice Award, and whoever wins that People's Choice a survey during the program is going to get a free gingerbread book right here from CPF. So I would encourage everyone to join that. It's going to be fun. We have a chef coming and some special guests because we're saving up all of our energy for that happy hour, right, John? John's like, yes, we are. <laughs> all right. So I'd like to get on with this program. I'm so excited to hear about these lodges and ski slopes and the history of all of these things. I'd like to introduce Sarah. You can go ahead and turn on your video. Yes, Sarah, take it away, Sarah. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk about Timberline Lodge um, this morning. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And... There we go. I um, think we're ready to go here. Um, I, my name is Sarah Monroe. I've been active with the nonprofit Friends of Timberline for, well, since its um, inception in 1975, uh, when we had the opportunity to talk to original builders and artists, all of whom are now gone. Uh, anyway, during that time, I developed a passion for the history of the of Timberline Lodge. So um, Timberline is a ski lodge at 6,000 feet on the south side of Mount Hood, the tallest peak in Oregon, which is like 11,245 feet. The entire Mount Hood area is in the Mount Hood National Forest. Timberline is the largest recreational facility in the United States Forest Ser Service, uh, forests, and is the only uh, recreational facility that was built and furnished by the Works Progress Administration, still is largely in its original condition and is operated in it for its original purpose as a ski lodge. It is an outstanding example of rustic architecture in the National Park Service tradition. It's a national landmark, one of 17 in Oregon. Well, the focus of this talk is the 1930s development of a ski resort on Mount Hood. I want to acknowledge that indigenous people use trails in the mountain for thousands of years to travel through, hunt, pick puckleberries, and follow spirit quests. This is a map on the left side of Mount Hood, which I copied from the end papers of Fred McNeil's 1937 book on the mountain. It shows the location of the lodge, trust me, on the right of center, kind of below the glaciers, which are marked like little um, animal footprints. Um, the heavy line that runs across the lower part of the map shows the southern part of the Mount Hood Loop Road 
that had been finished in 1926, opening the mountain to skiers, hikers, and others. The Forest Service designated the area around Timberline for recreation. In the 1920s, Forest Service Recreation Officer Scotty Williamson selected a tract, Track D, where the lodge was ultimately situated as the ideal site for a lodge on the south side of the mountain. He's shown here on the right side at the construction site for the lodge in 1936. Although many were enthusiastic about a lodge project, no private funding was available to develop it. When the Works Progress Administration was established in May 1935, Emerson J. Griffith was named Oregon's WPA administrator, and as one of his first projects, he applied for funding for the construction of a ski lodge. The application was approved in December. The project sponsor, the Forest Service, wanted a nationally recognized architect and selected Gilbert Stanley Underwood, who had designed such rustic park lodges as Bryce Canyon Lodge and the Awani in Yosemite. In the first proposed plans that Underwood's assistant brought to Portland in January 1936, the shape of the lodge was an octagonal headhouse with two wings extending out facing uphill. U.S. Forest Service architect Tim Turner suggested turning the building around so that it would face downhill and avoid the accumulation of snow at the door. The octagon was changed to a hexagon, opening up the wings, improving the view, and the size was reduced. Forest Service architects completed all the blueprints through the spring. The first actual work began on February 15, 1936, and included opening the six, a six and one half mile road to the building site. This was arduous work that lasted through the spring. Construction of the lodge itself started on June 15, 1936. The groundbreaking ceremony is pictured on the right. Skiers had been hiking up the south side of Mount Hood for years, but increased accessibility in the late 1920s gave rise to such groups as the Portland Winter Sports Association, which began to plan ski competitions in the government camp area below the lodge site in the mid 1930s. You can see a ski jumper on the left. The, jump, the ski jump uh, competitions were held at Multipore, which is a nearby ski uh, area. In, it's in uh, government camp. A ski race at the lodge was scheduled for the day of groundbreaking, that June 1936 day. It was a combined downhill and slalom event that brought skiers from Crater Rock 10,560 feet at the top of or near the top of the uh, mountain to the lodge site down at 6,000 feet. Norwegian immigrant and top Nordic skier Halmar Ham, pictured on the right, won the ski race that day and many races that were held on Mount Hood. He also invented the first safety release binding, which was known as the safe ski. Construction started with the two wings. The head house was placed in between. Workers were housed at a former civilian conservation camp about six miles away and bussed up daily to the building site. The workers' wages ranged between 55 cents per hour for unskilled and 90 cents per hour for skilled work, but they all paid a dollar per day for room and board. The photo on the left shows construction of the head house between the two wings. Harry Hopkins, National WPA Administrator, visited Timberline on September 14, 1936, and he may be uh, pictured in the photograph on the right. He was reportedly pleased by the progress of the building at that time. The head house is the most distinctive art feature architecturally. In the interior, it reflects the pioneer theme in the main lobby. Beams extend out from the stone chimney like a wagon wheel with decorated iron strapping. The mezzanine railing and the post and rail on the floor of the main lobby resemble corrals. Lamp bases look like branding irons and light fixtures in the mezzanine alcoves mimic pioneer lanterns. Hanging chandeliers and hexagonal oak coffee tables repeat the shape of the hexagonal headhouse. 
Stonemasons worked on the 500 ton stone chimney and exterior facing using stone collected locally. Many were Italian immigrants who had learned their skill in Italy and some built stone walls and tunnels at other sites in Port, uh, Portland area. The six ponderosa pine columns in main lobby were hand hewn by Henry Steiner. You can see one of the columns at the back of the picture on the left. Uh, Steiner charged $25 uh, to hew each piece and um, asked that workmen uh, turn the logs. Carving in the lintels over the doorways and the lower lobby, which is pictured on the right, and the weather vane were drawn from the page in the Campfire Girl handbook that depicts the year in moons. These were adapted um, Native American uh, symbols. Marjorie Hoffman Smith, the assistant administrator for the Federal Art Project in Oregon was retained as interior decorator. Smith pulled the interior together and created an overall whole using arts and crafts and art deco details in interior finishing. Recycling was used when possible. For example, worn CCC uniforms were torn about part and hooked into rugs. Smith developed 28 designs for 61 guest rooms based on Native American, Amer Native flowers, excuse me, and fauna. The rooms illustrated here depict the Solomon seal flora design and the forest and stream theme. The textiles were created by the Women's and Professional Project under the WPA in the Elks Temple in Portland, where women sewed applique draperies for main lobby and guest room areas, hooked 119 rugs for floors in lobbies and the guest rooms, and wove 912 yards of fabric for draperies in the Cascade dining room and upholstery throughout. Only one member of a family could be employed on the WPA at a time, so most of the women who worked on the project were widowed or divorced, and the average age was 56. Daryl Austin painted five oil paintings illustrating mountain activities, but of the five, only two hung originally at the lodge until the remaining three were loaned to the lodge more recently. This painting on the left the, is the musicians. The theme of mountain activities was also used by Doug Lynch in creating carved and painted linoleum panels, which are in the original ski grill, now the Barlow room. On the right, is the last painting that was commissioned for Timberline under the Federal Art Project, The Mountain. It's by Charles Haney. Smith had taken Haney to Timberline on July 20th of 1937 to discuss and perhaps to allow him to draw some sketches for a com this commissioned oil. It was finished in September 1937 and it hung in the in the lodge in a temporary white frame that Haney, Haney had made for it. I believe the frame is the original frame still. The mountain currently is, hangs in the main lobby and it's one of the two largest paintings that Haney ever did. C.S. Price painted the huckleberry pickers at the top on the left and pack train at the bottom on the left for the end wall in the Cascade dining room. These are also two of the largest and perhaps the most significant of paintings by C.S. Price. He was able to paint these large works because materials were provided to him through the Federal Art Project. The murals were um, rejected for hanging in that location at the, originally and were replaced by the two murals you can see at the right in very different style by Howard Sewell, symbolizing lodge builders wood and symbolizing lodge builders metal. The Sewell paintings were removed for restoration in the 1970s and now hang on the mezzanine and the Price murals hang at the lodge in the CS Price wing. President Franklin D. Roosevelt came to Oregon to dedicate Bonneville Dam, but agreed to motor around Mount Hood to dedicate Timberline Lodge on September 28, 1937. Griffith orchestrated the event with Oregon politicians and involved the federal theater and music projects in the entertainment. The lodge was not open, but rooms were assigned to the Roosevelts who did not stay overnight. The elevator was in service so that FDR, <coughs> excuse me, could deliver the dedication from the terrace. 
Roosevelt dedicated the lodge to the WPA workers who built it. The group ate lunch inside the lodge in the main lobby, and after lunch, they looked around briefly and left for the train station in Portland, passing a CCC camp um, on the way down the mountain at Zigzag. The lodge was not completed until um, February of 1938, another four months. By that time, the entire cost of the lodge uh, had amounted to about a million dollars. It opened in February 1938 in a snowstorm. It had been designed, built, and furnished in just over two years. The Magic Mile chairlift was built the next year on the east side of the lodge. Its terminus was at um, Silcox Hut, named after Ferdinand Silcox, chief of the Forest Service, who was instrumental in supporting both construction of the lodge in 1935 and the chairlift before he died. Prince Olaf and Princess Martha of Norway dedicated the lift in May 1939, while it was under construction, by tightening a steel bolt with an oversized silver plated wrench. Timberline Lodge Inc. operated the lodge until 1942 when it was closed for the duration of, nine, of the World War II. It reopened in 1945. A bar was added on the mezzanine in 1950 gambling was introduced. The operator who acquired the permit in 1954 did not provide needed maintenance or pay bills. Sandy Electric Co-op turned off the electricity on February 18, 1955, and everyone left the lodge in darkness. The Forest Service revoked the permittee's permit, and the future looked bleak. In April uh, 1955, Richard L. Constam became Timberline Area Operator. He reopened the lodge that summer and devoted his life to improving the lodge and the ski area. Um, RLK died in 2006, but his family still operates the lodge under the RLK and company and the ski area. In 2005, Hank Pander painted this portrait of um, uh, Richard Constam holding the lodge in his hand, signifying RLK's devotion to the lodge. Locally, uh, Richard Constam is known as the man who saved Timberline Lodge, and he truly was. In 1975, RLK was inspired by a Seattle visitor's suggestion to form a support group. He convinced his friend Jack Mills to form the nonprofit Friends at Timberline to raise funds for art and furnishing restoration. The picture on the right shows one of uh, Friends' most visible projects, funding a new winter entrance to replace the Quonset hut that had been used since the 1950s to protect the lodge entry from winter snows accumulating in front of it. The new winter entrance was completed in 2009. Two other uh, highly visible projects were um, the restoration of the amphitheater, uh, which Friends of Timberline funded in, and was completed in 2006, and restoration of the reflecting pools on the north side of the lodge, which was completed this last summer in 2021. Many people were unaware there were reflecting ponds on the north side of the lodge until this restoration was undertaken. Through a Save America's Treasures grant in the last several years, a nationally known conservator, Nina Olson, conserved all major wood art in the building. Here she is um, uh, pictured at, with the, at the pioneer scene, which is in the stairwell at the lodge. Linoleum panels and another specialist conserved works on paper. Um, in conclusion, I just wanted to mention that um, I have written a history of the lodge that was published in 2009 and just reissued this last year. And also you may be interested in the beautifully illustrated um, book by Margaret Suppley Smith called American Ski Resort um, Architecture Style. Amy? Thank you, Sarah. Um, while we're uh, having Amy switch over, I wanted to ask if there's a particular place we should uh, point people for your, for the book. Uh, that could be uh, available through me um, at my um, email address, which you are welcome to provide on the 
chat box or sure. however yeah, you want to do it. Thank I'll, you I'll so much. For I'll, I'll share it with everyone. Okay. Um, okay. Amy, I think we're uh, we're all set for you. I'm going to stop sharing here for Dara and Thanks. you're you're all set to go. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Let me get my screen shared here real quick. All right, so my name is Amy Wally and I am currently a cartographer at Adventure Cycling Association in Missoula, Montana. But six years ago, I was a graduate student in the geography program at the University of Montana. And I have been invited here today to talk about my thesis, which was titled The History and Evolution of North American Ski Resort Map Style and Design. So cartography is entwined with artistic influences and few types of maps display this relationship as obviously as ski resort maps. Over the past 80 years, hundreds of mountain ski resorts in North America have produced thousands of maps, many of which are incredible works of art. Despite this rich history, very limited academic research existed concerning the style and design of North American ski maps. The goal of my thesis was to undertake a complete analysis of ski map style and design for the first time. The part that I will focus on in this presentation is the factors that influence design elements and techniques over time, and I'll be summarizing the progression of the most prominent ski map artists and showing a selection of their maps. The first modern ski resort map in North America was founded in 1936 in Sun Valley, Idaho by Avril Harriman. It was modeled after the ski resorts Harriman had seen on his trips to Europe and featured the world's first chairlift. It was immediately very successful and soon after several more ski resorts opened up across the United States and Canada. In the early years, most ski resort maps in North America were rather modest views hand drawn by local artists. Most were either black and white, grayscale, or only used partial or limited color. Here are some examples of early ski resort maps. Notice the lack of a trail, standard trail rating system, the extravagant north arrows, the lack of depth, and the use or lack thereof of color. By the 1960s, skiing had become a popular wintertime activity, and to keep up with the demand, ski resorts were building at a record pace. In the 10 years between 1956 and 1966, a total of 1,000 new chairlifts were constructed at an average of 50 new resorts each year. By 1966, there were 662 resorts in North America. The new resorts featured state-of-the-art technology, including faster chairlifts, snow grooming machines, and snowmaking equipment which helped guarantee a good ski experience, but came with a cost. The resorts were priced for the middle and upper classes and photographs of celebrities at ski resorts helped develop skiing's reputation into somewhat of a sexy sport that was worthy of the rich and famous. This increase in competition led to a demand for more elaborate maps that would impress potential customers. Hal Shelton responded to this demand and became one of the earliest artists in North America to make ski resort mapping his career. Born in California in 1916, Shelton spent his early career working as a cartographer for the US Geological Survey and is known for his innovative ideas regarding natural color maps and contour shading. By the early 1960s, Shelton was an established cartographer living in Colorado at the epicenter of the ski resort construction frenzy. Shelton's professional training in cartography, user-friendly mapping techniques and ideal location in Colorado provided him with the perfect credentials to create impressive maps for the new resorts. Shelton hand-painted maps for several world-class resorts, including Bear Valley, Alta, and Mammoth. His paintings are characterized by a realistic color palette, thick brushstrokes for background features, and individ individually painted trees in the foreground. Shelton's work was well-received, and he dominated the ski mapping industry in the Western United States for much of the 1960s and 70s. The inception of Hal Shelton's style of ski map can be traced back to the early 1930s in Austria, where a young man named Henrik Baron taught himself the art of painting. In 1934, Baron painted his first oblique viewed landscape called a panorama of a newly opened mountain road in Austria and won first prize in a competition for his efforts. His unanticipated success in the competition convinced him to pursue panorama painting, subsequently initiating a long and prosperous career. 
From 1934 to 1994, Braun painted over 500 panoramas, almost exclusively of mountainous areas. The majority of his panoramic maps illustrate majestic views of tourist locations and ski areas in his native Alps, but he also painted scenes in Asia, Africa, and North America. Braun's work is known for his use of vivid colors, glistening lakes, and whimsical cloud formations. Although Baron only painted one map of a ski resort in North America, Squaw Valley, California, his works went on to influence many American ski map artists after him. Today, Baron is widely recognized as the most accomplished panoramist of all time and as the father of the modern panorama map. Despite the fact that Baron did not actually invent the panorama, they've been around since the late 1700s, it is generally recognized that he perfected the style, especially of mountainous terrain and his work continues to serve as the inspirational standard today. As the 1970s came to a close, Hal Shelton began to pursue other career interests in fine art. The shift in Shelton's career provided the circumstances for a new ski map artist to emerge into the business and Bill Brown took the opportunity. Little is known about Brown's personal life other than he also lived in Colorado. Brown monopolized the ski mapping industry for much of the late 70s and 80s, hand painting panoramas for dozens of resorts across the United States. During his career, he produced maps for at least 15 resorts in Colorado alone and for many major resorts such as Keystone, Aspen, and Alpine Meadows. Brown's paintings evoke a familiar style seen in Hal Shelton's work of which Brown presumably drew some inspiration. At times nearly indistinguishable, Brown's paintings are similarly characterized by a realistic color palette and individually painted trees. In addition, nearly all of Brown's paintings feature the resort at a low oblique angle with the nearby peaks appearing sharp and prominent against a cloudless blue sky. Aspen still uses Brown's original painting to this day. Murray Hay entered into the ski map industry in the early 1980s, hand painting maps for over a dozen large resorts while living and working out of Alberta, Canada. It is difficult to describe exactly what differentiates Hay's style from his colleagues, particularly that of Shelton and Brown. Perhaps the only giveaway that you are viewing a map created by Murray Hay is the actual physical location of the resort. According to my research, Hay painted maps almost exclusively for resorts located in British Columbia and Alberta. Only three trail maps of his are not located in British Columbia or Alberta. In the mid 1990s, advancements in computer technology began to challenge the pervasiveness of manually created ski maps. Terra Graphics, run by Peter Powers, has pro produced digitally constructed ski maps for several resorts in North America since the mid 1990s. The maps are created using a raster based computer program to achieve a look that is reminiscent of the hand painted style. The final results are well crafted and aesthetically pleasing, yet feel slightly inorganic compared to their hand painted counterparts. On some maps, it is obvious that the same few trees are duplicated throughout the forest. This technique lowers production time and expense at the cost of natural variation within the vegetation. Vista Map is operated in the greater New York City area by Gary Milliken. Since 1993, Milliken has produced custom digital trail map illustrations for many major ski resorts, including Vail, Alpine, and Steamboat. Milliken's artwork is unique in that the features are entirely vector-based, except for the shade, some shading on the snow itself. The result is a clean depiction of the mountain consisting of crisp lines and vividly colored polygons. The vector style of Milliken's artwork is especially apparent in the background, where the mountains are highly stylized. Vistamap is still actively producing ski maps today. Despite the dominance of computer technology in general society over the last two decades, hand-painted ski maps are still commonly seen today thanks in large part to one man, James Nehues. It's hard to overstate just how prolific Nehues currently is in the industry of ski resort mapping. Here is a list from his website of all the ski resorts he's painted, a whopping 164 resorts in North America and 17 others internationally. James Nehus learned to paint in ninth grade while living in Loma, Colorado. His early career was spent working several different jobs before he finally decided to pursue painting as a viable profession at age 40. 
Mejios had always admired the work of Bill Brown and decided to contact him with the prospect of overflow jobs. Coincidentally, Brown's professional interests were shifting from resort painting to video production, and in 1988, he offered Mehus his first trail mapping job of Mary Jane Mountain at Winter Park Resort in Colorado. Mehus continued to accept jobs originally meant for Brown and eventually began obtaining trail map jobs of his own. Since 1988, Mehus claims to have painted over 240 ski maps. His maps have become so inescapable that they have been taken for, the grant, for granted as the norm. An article written in 2014 explains, his works are so familiar that when you stumble upon a trail map that's not by him, it's almost disorienting. A friend once declared, this trail map isn't by James Mehus, so I have no idea where I am. Mehus' success in the ski mapping business is well-deserved. Crediting Baron, Shelton, Brown, and Hay as his greatest artistic influences, Mehus is panoramas pay homage to his predecessor's traditional hand-painted style while adding his own personal flair. A typical ski map by Nihus features the mountain freshly powdered with a blanket of snow, each individual tree meticulously detailed and precisely placed, and vivid colors that attract the eye and lend energy to the scene. In 1997, Nihus began tinting the sky pink with alpine glow, which has become a distinctive trait seen in many of his maps. Mihus begins the map making process by examining aerial photographs of the resort at various altitudes and angles. He then uses an airbrush to depict the sky and snow, critical for making the mountain appear blanketed in soft powder. The rest of the image is completed using a paintbrush in gauche and opaque watercolor, which makes future changes to the trails easier. He's semi-retired in 2014, but continues to draw and paint landscapes today. Since Nehuse's retirement, it is uncertain who, if anyone, will continue the hand-painted ski map tradition. With advancements in technology and to an extent climate change, it's possible that the days of elaborate hand-painted ski maps of massive ski resorts are coming to an end. If you're interested in this topic and would like to read my full thesis, you can find it here. Um, again, my name is Amy Wally, but my last name was Lippus in 2015 when my thesis was published. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer anyone's questions during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, and I did paste into the uh, chat box a link to our annual auction item, uh, which was offered generously by Mr. James Nee Hughes. Um, you'll find a copy of his book on our website at the auction page at californiapreservation.org slash bid. Um, so I, I hate to create a bidding war here, but that's kind of our purpose uh, at CPF to raise money at the end of the year. So feel free to bid your friends out uh, on this item. I think it's currently going for 120 or so. Um, and I'm going to, Amy, I'm going to paste a link to your thesis in the chat box here in a moment so people can click on that link. So thank you very much for that presentation. We'll uh, get back to you with questions later. Um, so now we're going to turn it over to Mr. Werner Weiss, who will talk about uh, a ski resort that is unbuilt uh, by Walt Disney. So Werner, it looks like you're all sharing. I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Starting it up. Okay, um, hi, my name is Werner Weiss. I have been writing about Disneyland history for over 25 years and related subjects. About 10 years ago, one of those related subjects was to write about Walt Disney's Mineral King, uh, the resort that uh, was supposed to be built in what's now the center of Sequoia National Park. Um, but never was. And that's what this uh, show is going, this uh, presentation is going to be about. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about why um, Walt was interested in ski resorts and um, why uh, this the Mineral King really was his personal vision, not just um, you know, a, you know, a corporate endeavor um, as maybe today's Walt Disney Company would you know, figure out what's going to make money. Uh, in this case, it was really a, a vision by Walt. Um, with that, I'll go back to my, to my notes here. In 1931, uh, Walt took up skiing after his doctor told him he needed to go, get away from his studio, get some exercise, uh, clear his mind. Um, so he took classes in uh, Yosemite at Badger Pass with an Aust Austrian skiing champion, Hannes Scholl, and they hit it off. And then when... Uh, Scholl was going to build his own ski resort. 
uh, in the late 30s, he um, needed investors. He asked Walt. Walt uh, jumped at the chance, wrote a check for $2,500, and became one of the first uh, sh uh, shareholders in, uh, in what is Sugarloaf. So and to honor Walt's support, Hannes Schroll changed the name of Hemlock Peak to Mount Disney. And as this ski map shows, the third peak over from the, from the left is still called Mount Disney today. And the chairlift that goes up to Mount Disney was the first chairlift installed in the state of California. Uh, let's jump forward now to 1958 when Walt was uh, winter to Zermatt, Switzerland near the Matterhorn during the filming of the live action film, Third Man on the Mountain. Um, Walt uh, loved the town and the mountain and he wanted both for himself, uh, specifically to bring them back to California. So he built a scaled down model of the Matterhorn as a ride at Disneyland that opened in 1959, but the mountain village was gonna have to wait a bit. Another uh, mountain activity for Walt was in 1960, he was asked to be chairman of pageantry for the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley near Lake Tahoe. He and his team were responsible for the opening and closing uh, ceremonies and also some entertainment in the evenings. And everything that Walt did there was a huge hit. And Walt saw that he could entertain people in, in uh, outdoors in cold weather. And he also saw though, once again, that um, what was up there, Lake Tahoe really wasn't his liking, not Squaw Valley, not the other things. He could design and build a better ski resort than any of those places around Lake Tahoe. So he hired a consultant to study sites for a ski resort. Um, and uh, the, they looked in Southern California because of the large population in Los Angeles, um, but the ski there was, uh, the snow there was too unreliable. Um, he found a perfect spot in um, at Mineral King, um, or at least it seemed like a perfect spot. It was uh, relatively close to Los Angeles, but actually about the same distance from Los Angeles and San Francisco. It was surrounded on three sides by a Sequoia National Park, but it was not part of the national park itself. So it was under the um, jurisdiction of the US Department of Agriculture, which actually wanted to encourage the uh, uses of its land like skiing and other outdoor recreation uh, activities. Um, there was a road. The problem with the road was it was only partially paved. It was treacherous and only usable in months that were free from snow, which is pretty bad if you're building a ski resort that you can't have snow on the road. Um, and it went through a national park. So um, this road is going to uh, come up again in this presentation. In uh, a couple more things about uh, Mineral King. In 1948, the Sierra Club had backed a plan for a ski resort at Mineral King but the inadequate roll, uh, road killed the project. In 1958, Tulare County um, asked the state of California to put in an all-weather road. Um, the county recognized that Mineral King had possibly the greatest potential for winter sports anywhere in the Sierra Nevada mountains. In 1965, the California legislature transferred the county road to the state highway system, and the Forest Service began to accept uh, proposals for a ski resort. So here's the announcement in 1965, uh, right around this time of year, where the US uh, chose Disney to develop the uh, resort. There had been six other developers wanting to build, but Disney came up with the best preliminary plan. They had three years to come up with a permanent plan that would then uh, give them a permanent 30 year permanent permit. Um, and by the way, as far as the timing, just a month earlier is what Disney had announced buying over 27,000 acres of land in Florida for a big development there that was going to include a city of the future and a city of the past. Um, and uh, so they, he, he was taking on quite a bit. And now he was also going to build a $35 million year round resort with a real emphasis on year round because this wasn't just going to be a ski resort. This was going to bring in families for hiking and all sorts of other outdoor activities and was going to be busy all year. In fact, it was going to make most of its money in the summer. It would attract 2.5 million visitors annually with 800,000 of them from out of state by 1976. That's when it was supposed to have its first full year of operation. The 30 year permit was contingent on the 25 mile highway being built, but surely it was going to be built because there was demand for ski resort, a good plan, 2,500 permanent jobs at stake, and um, what could go wrong? So here's a quote from Walt Disney about how he 
wanted to keep, uh, keep, in fact, I'll read it. When I first saw Mineral King five years ago, I thought it was one of the most beautiful spots I'd ever seen, and I want to keep it that way. Other people wanted to keep it that way too, but for other people, it meant that this 7,900 foot valley uh, surrounded by these incredible mountains should stay the way it was. The way it was, was relatively unchanged, uh, you know, almost natural, except on the valley floor, there were some cabins uh, from the early 20th century and uh, remnants of some mining operations in the early, uh, in the 19th century, which is why it wasn't part of the national park uh, to begin with, but was part of the national forest system. So what Walt envisioned in this valley was this beautiful alpine uh, ski resort uh, an entire village that would that would feel like you were in a village in the, in the Swiss Alps. Um, very different from what he saw at places like Lake Tahoe. So this is um, about oh, 10 months later. He's at a press conference with Mineral, at Mineral King. Everything was on track. How am I doing with time? Speaking of on track. Um, Edmund G. Pat Brown had announced, uh, who was a governor at the time, had announced $3 million dollar a federal grant towards building a road, and he was going to come up with the rest of the money. Uh, strong support from the governor, so it seemed certain the road was going to be built. And um, then, less than three months later, well, well, we'll keep, we'll keep going here first. So, early concept art showed um, this kind of 1960s architecture, which I find surprising. Uh, I almost imagine Walt looking at this and going, "Well, this isn't what I had in mind, but we need to release something to the press." So um, let's let, let's release it and let's fix it. It actually looks nice, but it's not the uh, the uh, traditional Alpine uh, village that uh, that Walt had envisioned. And the whole approach was about uh, about uh, preserving the natural beauty. So yeah, the uh, this uh, quote refers to a 2,500 vehicle parking garage. Later, I've also heard it uh, referred to as a 3,600 vehicle parking garage. That would be eight to ten stories would be worked into the ground so it would appear to be underground so you wouldn't see a parking structure and everybody in the town was going to walk or take public conveyances. And um, again, very different than, than what was in California at the time. Now, just three months after the, um, uh, after the press conference, Walt Disney died. And um, with it though, there were still three Walt Disney projects that were very much alive. One was building the big resort and a city in Florida. Another was Cal Arts, the art school in Valencia. And the third was uh, to follow through on Mineral King. And the uh, people who are running the company uh, in Walt's absence had every intention of continuing with all three of those. In 1969, the plan was approved by the Forest Service. This is the, uh, the, the this is now about, the, this is the plan that, uh, uh, that would open the door to the 30 year uh, permit. You notice the architecture by this time has changed to a much more traditional Swiss looking architecture. People walking around again, no cars. Um, very nice, very pic picturesque. I made a list of, the, this is kind of an, a, a list, a combination of the 1966 initial uh, proposals and the 1969 plan. Um, but you can see that uh, in addition to the um, large hotels, there's gonna be housing for employees. There was gonna be all sorts of other winter activities. And then the, the list on the right side, some of those are more summer activities. There would be like tennis and horseback riding and um, all the utilities were gonna be underground in a 60,000 square foot service facility. This was gonna just be an, a, a really a magical place to use an overused Disney adjective. Here's another piece of concept art from 1969. Now I do notice a parking lot in the top center of the corner. I don't know if that's the top level of the eight to 10 story structure, um, but you can see in any case, it doesn't look like a hulking structure. It looks like um, a, a relatively small lot that would be an entry then into the village. Now we get it back into the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club had been supporting Mineral King and had suggested it back in, uh, in 48, had been uh, supportive of a resort there as recently as, as 1965, but now they've filed a suit in federal court to stop it. And um, so the, uh, and they were, they were both, I'm not gonna go into all the, we could do a, a two hours on all these lawsuits, which I'm not going to do, 
But uh, in the end, um, it did very much slow down the project. Disney came up with a Disney, in this case, the, I'm talking about the company, not the man, came up with a revised plan that was going to be much smaller. Um, the controversial road was going to be replaced with a non polluting cog railway. There was going to, all the facilities were going to be scaled down. It wasn't going to be this massive project that people were afraid of. It was going to cost less. And um, my theory is that, the, the, that they had, well, I know that they had very little money left because uh, Walt Disney World in Florida went so far over budget that they, um, they did need to, uh, they didn't have a lot, they didn't have $35 million sitting around to, uh, to develop a ski resort. Found some more concept art. This is from the Walt Disney Family Museum. Um, this shows a third architectural style, and I'm not sure if this is the scaled down plan or not. It um, certainly, um, again, looks nice, but in some ways it, it looks, you know, less themed, less like you're in an alpine resort. And more concept art here. This is um, a building not quite in the village, and I wonder if this is a, you know, a place that people would ski to and hike to and uh, be served um, food and drinks. Uh, again, nice artwork. Now let's talk about why Mineral King ultimately failed. There were the lawsuits. There was the, uh, the fact that you had two different government agencies with different ideas of how land should be used. And most importantly, there was that road going right through the, uh, on, on the left side. You can, you can see the, the line that kind of goes on the side of the hill is that, is that treacherous road. It's still there today. People still use it to go hiking in the summer. But uh, obviously, it was never turned into the highway that, uh, that was envisioned for Mineral King. In, uh, 19, in the early 70s, they started uh, going, working on a, um, on a separate site. This is, uh, they still wanted to do a ski resort. After all, that was Walt's vision. They still wanted it to be this lovely Alpine village, but now it was going to be north of um, Lake Tahoe at Independence Lake. Um, and this is the 1975 concept, and I found pictures in the annual report of the 1977 concept. Again, it looks real nice. Big advantage is that it's on a lake, which is even nicer for summer recreation. Even bigger advantages are that the Sierra Club blessed it, that uh, it was all on private land. It didn't involve the Park Service or the Forest Service. And uh, there was going to be nothing that could stop it except the state of California. And after years of red tape, they finally threw in the towel on this one, too. Um, in 1978, Congress moved Mineral King to the Park Service. So that peninsula that you saw going into Sequoia National Park is no longer a, a, a peninsula. It's now all contiguous, all part of, uh, of the park. The legislation even said that um, there could be no ski facilities at all built in Mineral King, completely um, killing any future Mineral King plans. And with that, um, I have some photo credits and art credits that I will not dwell on. And I'm gonna go to my final slide, which is, I mentioned at the beginning that I write about Disneyland history. If you would like to see um, articles about all the favorite rides, primarily ones that aren't there anymore, as well as attractions at, uh, in, in Florida that aren't there anymore. Um, this is the website and I, and I publish um, every Friday, um, early wee hours of the morning. And you can also get links on Yesterland if you wanna see new ones. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you, Warner. Um, we're gonna dive right into the questions. Before we get going, I just wanted to give a shout out to Missoula, Montana. Um, because we have, I think it's a fan group for Amy, uh, who's joining us uh, from, <laughs> from YouTube, and they're all uh, congratulating you, Amy, on, on your performance today. So um, well, thank you. They, they may have some questions. I'll keep an eye on YouTube here to see if they have any questions for you. But um, I wanted to turn it right into the first question that I have here. There were a few that came into the chat box. Um, and I think I'll... Uh, I'll start with a question for Amy. Uh, Jennifer is asking you, uh, for the older hand-painted maps still in use, are these base maps onto which new trails can be marked over time as they are republished and the resorts change? Yes, so the way it works is that the artist will paint the base mountain and then the, they'll, they'll pass it over to the resort and then the resort will overlay the trails, the names, all the text is usually always overlaid by the resort itself. And if there's any changes, um, if the artist is still 
painting and still alive, I guess, they'll contact the artist and if they wanna make any changes, they'll ask them and the artist will usually be able to kind of tweak some things um, or they'll hire someone new to take it into Photoshop and Photoshop some things. Um, if the mountain adds new, um, adds new terrain, like sometimes the mountain will add the new backside or a new terrain park or something like that. Sometimes they'll put like an inset map on top of the map itself and have the artist paint in there or hire someone to do something like that. So um, they are they are somewhat um, able to be manipulated after the original map is painted, but sometimes they don't have to and they can be used for many, many years over and over and over. Great, thank you, Sarah. I, I mean, uh, Amy, that was uh, so interesting. I never thought about the ski maps as being their own kind of a, a genre. Um, uh, Sarah, I had a question for you. You went through this about the Ele I saw it real tiny on one of your slides, the Eleanor Roosevelt room, and it was. And then you talked about the workers who made the textiles, and you said something about the women who were doing that. Could you just review that again? Because it kind of went by sort of fast, and I missed some of it. it. You said something about like their age. Is that what you were talking about of the women who worked on the textiles? Yes, um, I was saying that they worked for the. Their average age was fifty six, but they were working under a. a one of the WPA programs is the Women's and Professional Project. And it was a WPA rule that um, in any family that um, only one person could be uh, employed under the WPA. So mm -hmm. these women were mostly widowed or um, divorced or in some way single. That's, a, that's basically my age and some of the other descriptions fit me too. So I could have worked for the WPA. I just thought that was so uh, interesting that, the, you know, that they visited and they didn't even stay overnight. I wanted it to be all romantic and the president stayed there. I, I guess they're just too busy. Um, and I have some questions too about the movies, but I think it, I'm going to hand it to John. You go first. <laughs> well, I, I actually have a movie question, which, which is directed to Werner. Um, and maybe you do as well, Chris, but um, this one is about Walt Disney and his uh, interest in alpine um, environments. I'm not sure if you went over it in the beginning because I was sort of multitasking there, but my understanding is that he was inspired during the filming of a Walt Disney production to create the Matterhorn. And I'm wondering if that long interest in alpine environments sort of stemmed from that one visit uh, uh, by Walt Disney and, and why, why you think he was just fascinated with this type of environment. Well, he enjoyed skiing himself. And in fact, one of the early Goofy cartoons uh, in the early 1940s shows uh, Goofy um, skiing at uh, Sugarloaf. And you can actually see the Sugarloaf sign in the background. After all, Walt was a shareholder. But yeah, I do think that Third Man in the Mountain was uh, what influenced the Matterhorn. One story I've heard, I don't know how true it is, that he sent a postcard back to his team in uh, California of the Matterhorn and said, build this, signed Walt. And uh, they, they figured out and it's, it was probably not quite that terse, but um, and so they went and got pictures of the um, from National Geographic of what the Matterhorn looked like and uh, designed their own 147 uh, foot version of a mountain that was 14,700 feet in, in reality. So, um, uh, so I think that was a big part of it. But he had always had this interest in cities too. There's a whole wonderful book called Walt and the Promise of Progress City. Walt wanted Epcot to be a, a city, not a not a theme park. And so the idea of a ski village and any of these other physical environments that would be without cars was, was right up his alley. Well, I have a question since we're talking about the Matterhorn. There was a basketball court inside the Matterhorn. Is that right? It's a uh, it's, a, it's there's a basketball Ish. hoop that, okay. the, that people that employees who worked in there could use it as a uh, in a break as a break room uh, recreation and I don't think it's there anymore as they remodeled it they needed that space for something else but you that's yeah I've, I read about that and uh, for anybody on the webinar right now if you were at Disneyland in the old days you can take those little buckets and you'd go on the little ride through that and you'd go through the Matterhorn when, it, when were those buckets retired I didn't wouldn't even know what those were called that ride that was in the mid '90s. It was the Skyway to Fantasyland and the Skyway to Tomorrowland, and it went right, right through the middle of the Matterhorn because the Matterhorn. One of the purposes of the Matterhorn was to cover up this unsightly tower that held up in Walt's mind that held up the uh, the buckets, because uh, he had this big ugly tower that, that for the cables. 
Oh, the, the buckets were fun, but probably a good idea. They retired. So, um, believe, believe it or not, Chris, I'm 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 old enough to remember. Uh, you writing. remember the buckets? Yeah. So they were I'm fun, but bad, people throw young. stuff. <laughs> Um, but I think I think Chris had a question about the shining. I don't know if you're going to ask it now. Oh, you know I did. Okay, so anybody who knows me outside of CPF knows that I am a you know I did partake in many many horror movies repeatedly and often. So Sarah, of course, we aren't going to let you go without asking about the shining. We've had a couple of questions. Uh, for one, like what parts of the building were used in the shining? Uh, is there's not a maze there? I'm sure you a lot of people ask you is the maze up there? Uh, but just for one, uh, was any of the the road up you know when uh, so for people who aren't familiar with the shining it's a movie from 1980 i believe uh directed by stanley kubrick based on a novel written by stephen king in 1979 uh see i pay attention to these things anyway so uh in the beginning of that movie there's like a helicopter shot going up to the lodge is that the actual road used in the that's in the shining i'll have to go back and look at that i I, I'm not sure. I know they only use the exterior of the lodge for the movie itself. And that uh, I think that I want to say uh, Estes Park. And again, I, I haven't checked this out in Colorado may have been used for the interior. I hope I'm not wrong on that. No, they but, use they did use part of it for the interior. Yes, <laughs> I'll have to visit that as well. But I will go back and look at the road. I don't know how much of the road might have been used. And as of course, there is no um, maze outside of the lodge um so, such as was seen in the movie it's an alpine uh, environment so it's pretty sparse in terms of what's actually growing there you saw that in the reflecting um pond uh image the the kind of scrubby trees and um, yeah and and for anyone who's interested in this history of this hotel in terms of movie there is a lot of information about how in the movie they use the outside of the of the timberline but the 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 actual story was inspired by Stephen King's stay at the Estes Park one and then there's some other the red room in the bathroom of the anyway I could go on is inspired by a building in Arizona there's a lot of cool architectural history associated with this particular story but um I have one that's maybe more formal in architecture uh, why was the orientation of the timberline lodge rotated to face downhill when ultimately that made the snow pile up at the front door? Uh, actually, the reverse. It was uh, rotated to, to face downhill to avoid having the snow accumulate in the, what would have been a V going uh, toward the mountain. And it was because uh, Gilbert Stanley Underwood hadn't come to see the mountain, so he didn't realize that the snowfall and drift was going to be coming downhill. So they did turn it around to face south, which actually, uh, and changing the shape to a hexagon opened up the wings so they had much better views. Um, it's just that naturally through the snow, it, it, the way that the lodge was designed, it didn't protect the entry from snow accumulation anyway. And there are pictures of people skiing off of the roof um, when the snow accumulated. So um, they, they chose, they made a better choice by turning it around um, and they did. Also locally, I might add that even though I described the architecture as rustic here in Oregon, it is known as Cascadian, which is kind of a local term for this type of architecture. And again, somewhat in the same vein as the Disney um, hopes uh, that um, desire to reproduce a European alpine um, ski village was definitely here. And they employed ski um, instructors from Switzerland. Pepe Gobble was one of the early instructors. And anyway, there was still that idea of a European chateau that um, I think is basic to the uh, um, notion of ski resorts in America. Thank you for making that distinction, uh, Sarah. As an Oregonian myself, I'm, I really appreciate the fact that there's now a regional style attached uh, specifically to Oregon. Um, <laughs> but I also wanted to ask you, because I, I had the same curiosity, but Eric is asking, um, do you have any tips on the best rates or times to stay at the Timberline? At Timberline, uh, the off season, the fall is a beautiful time to be there, um, September, October. And um, also the late spring, April, May are good times. Otherwise, the lodge um, normally, not during COVID, has been very heavily visited. They have about 2 million visitors per year. So it is hard to find those cheaper rates. There are these um, chalet rooms uh, in the 
um, on the ground floor that share rest um, bathrooms. They don't actually share them at the room, but there's a bathroom down the hall. And those are a little less expensive as well. I might say that when the lodge was built with using public works project, one of the concerns was um, expressed in the newspaper of, of having a ski resort funded by a public works project. But of course, it's an icon now that everyone loves. And they did try to appeal to um, less uh, to the what we might call the, um, the skiers who didn't have a lot of money. They did try to appeal to that population with these um, bunk rooms in the lower lobby. I mean, off of the lower lobby. Great, thank you so much. It looks like we lost Chris, so I get the uh, I have the honor of uh, closing us out today. I just wanted to thank our three speakers today. They were all fascinating presentations. Um, and I also pasted into the chat box a link to our uh, auction item that's specifically related to today's uh, program, the book by James Nee Hughes. Um, so you'll see that uh, on our website at californiapreservation.org slash bid. Um, I'm going to paste a link right now into the chat box uh, to go to californiapreservation.org slash e to let us know how we did today. And again, a round of applause to our audience today and a shout out to Missoula, Montana. Please come back and join us for uh, future programming. We'd love to have you. So I'm going to close this out today. Uh, Chris, did you have anything else? I, I, I left and I came right back. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for um, sharing all of your expertise with us. That was so enjoyable. And I learned a lot. And everything that John said, I double on that. <laughs> so, But we will see everybody soon. And make your gingerbread houses. I want to see what they look like. I'm so excited. All right, John, you go ahead. We'll see everyone soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.